the story of the world in the past many, many, many years, I mean, since the Industrial Revolution, is a positive story. It's a story of progress. It's a story of, it's an amazing story. Mm -hmm. And and we don't teach that. We don't seem to be, you know, exposing our students to that amazing story. We try to think about, oh, there's this little negative blips. Yes, there's negative blips. But like you're looking at the minutia as opposed to looking at this giant thing in front of you that is showing us a world that gets better, better, and better. Hello, and welcome back to the Hannah Franklin Podcast. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Carlos Carvalho. Carlos is a professor of statistics at the University of Texas at Austin, and he's the founder of the Salem Center for Policy at UT, where he hosts guest lectures, giving talks on topics ranging from economics to politics to social issues that are open both to students at UT, but also to the general public. And in today's conversation, Carlos and I talk about why some of the topics that he has at Salem Center are so controversial and why he feels like the conversations that they're having there might be harder to have in states other than Texas. We talk about what he's observed in the incoming freshman classes that he works with as a professor and how the academic standards of those classes have declined over the course of his career. And we talk about the importance of statistics in today's data-driven world and why we maybe don't spend enough time focusing on statistics with our kids and why there should be a heavier emphasis on in education and statistics for both higher education and also at the high school level. Carlos was a very interesting guest. I got to ask him a lot of questions that I've been wondering about, about teaching kids mathematics. And I hope that you enjoy listening to this episode. Carlos, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks. Glad to be here. I've been so excited for this interview, and I want to tee up a little bit of context about you before we get started to explain to the audience why I'm so excited to talk to you. I've never had a statistician on the podcast before, and I'm very excited about this because I think there's a lot of analysis around the types of conversations that many of the people I've had on the show have around education that warrant digging into and examining how to understand. So I'm very excited to talk about this. But also your reputation around Austin precedes you. So long before I (laughs) met you at an event, I had people that kept telling me, you have to check out the Salem Center. You have to check out the Salem Center. And then I met you and I was like, okay, this makes sense. Um, But can you give just like the brief background about the work that you do? All right. So just to background about me first, right? I'm a I'm a professor in statistics at the University of Texas at Austin, at the business school in particular. Um, I work in the sort of intersection between what it's called machine learning, statistics, and economics. So I do a lot of work that is economics motivated. Been a professor for a long, long time. And about six or seven years ago, um, un- not unlike many of us in Austin, I started noticing there was something missing in, in, in the space that I was in, in the university that I was in. And, and in particular, uh, like a, a good understanding of our economic system was something that was pretty much lacking in our students. Uh, and I'm talking, when I say students, I spend, spend a lot of my time teaching MBA. So these are graduate students that went through college already and are getting a, a postgraduate education. Um, so I felt that there's something that I could try to do around that notion. And I spend, my formative years in 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 undergrad, I was a student of economics in a school that was very much influenced by a, a Chicago school, a Milton Friedman type of a tradition in economics. And I think you know the shirt that I'm wearing right now, "No Solutions, Only Trade Offs," is I think it's a quote from one of Milton Friedman's students, Thomas Sowell, um, and the notion that there's no free lunch in life, right? So I was trying to make sure that, okay, can we bring those ideas back and provide an outlet for those ideas to be, again, uh, uh, exposed to our students around here? So with the help of some other people, we were able to come up with this thing called the Salem Center. Uh, we got some funding and we started working. And, and the Salem Center does work on three things. We try to support research on economic um, policy issues from a free market perspective. That's a sort of bread and butter for what we do is always from this lens of free markets and, 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 and freedom. Um, we do some teaching, we develop some classes to add to the portfolio classes there on campus. And I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite things that I, that I do on that later on. And, and we do a lot of events. So that's the thing is to pre- create a, a, an outlet for 
um, ideas that are in short supply on campuses to exist. So we will bring speakers that nobody else on campus will bring. And you know they tend to have a, a libertarian free market tint to, to, to them. But you know we touch on all sorts of things. I mean, we, we get into some controversies at times because we, we you know we we're truly a place that believes in free speech, that's willing to take you know pretty much any idea that is a meaningful idea that that you know exists in our world and willing to listen to people. So um, yeah, we've been doing that for for a while now, and I, I think that uh, the event that you you referred to, where we had Chris Rufo in town. Mm -hmm. And, and you can imagine Chris Rufo is not a, a, a someone that the university thinks very highly of, and <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I do, and 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 uh, you know we had a, a wonderful event, and I think Chris was an example of an event that embodies what we tried to do. There were a lot of uh, critics in the audience, people that stood up and had very pointed, targeted questions to Chris' uh, points about higher education in particular. And he responded, and we had a conversation, and we you know exchanged ideas in a tense way at times, but. Those ideas were exchanged in front of a large audience, and, and and that's what we need more of. What are you looking for in the types of controversial conversations that you are facilitating? Are they are you going strictly for controversy? Do they just no. happen to be controversial? And if so, what is your sort of litmus test for whether or not an idea is something that you want to be facilitating conversation around? All right. So I think that the number one idea question is whether that's an important policy idea. Right, so that's where we're a center for policy, and policy can be really broadly defined, right? So, so I mean, pretty much, government is such a ubiquitous thing in our lives that policy is everywhere, right? So, so um, I think that that's number one thing. It's an important policy issue, generally speaking. But, but I don't pers the controversy is not what we're looking for. Uh, but because we are a group that tries to, you know, if, it tries to come in from a perspective that is the perspective that is a minority on campus. I think it's going to be natural that because we're focusing on from that on things from that lens, right? Which we can say right of center, free market based, more libertarian. It ends up being at, at times being controversial because it's like it's unique. We don't, you know. We, so, so here's a couple of examples of controversial topics. Uh, we brought Alex Epstein. I don't know if you know the name. I met him. Yeah. Uh, so Alex is somebody that works on on the notion that fossil fuels are a very important thing. They're going to be with us for a long time, and you know, there there's a morality even in thinking about the use fossil the moral case of fossil fuels <laughs> exactly. Right. So that was a big controversy. We got protests that you know we're climate deniers. That and again, if you take the time to read Alex's work, there's nothing. There's no denial on his work. Is more like a question of cost benefit analysis and saying, listen, yeah, there's a cost to this, but the benefits are really large and and don't, we're gonna have to, we're gonna take advantage of those benefits. I don't think there's a, a way, a, way a, a path necessarily away from that. So that's one example. Um, we had, we had, um, um, I think for example, you know, we, we mentioned, we're gonna talk about Brian Kaplan later on. Brian became a member of the center. He's a collaborator with us. He writes our blog in the center. And, you know, Brian has ideas that are outside of the mainstream. and. Sometimes I think Brian wrote an essay, a set of essays, of it's titled, Don't Be a Feminist. Um, and has issues about, you know, and things that might not sound like policy related, but but it is policy related in the sense of, of uh, talks a lot about things associated with work, uh, uh, um, like, like uh, uh, human resource policies mm -hmm. in terms of like advancing different groups and so on. So there's a lot of interesting things coming from the economic perspectives in his work on that. But because it takes a not a contrarian, more like a, he calls himself a nonconformist approach to it, right? You know, we, we get a number of 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 emails and concerns and so on. <laughs> so, so I've, I'm used to that. Like recently, we had things on 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 the, of course the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that led to perhaps that was one of the most uh, tense events that we ever hosted. It was a it was an event around around that, or we brought an Israeli to talk about his views on on the on the conflict and. Those views are very much antagonistic to what is perceived. I perceive as the mainstream view on campus. You know, we needed ten cops in a room in order to have the event, and people got arrested <laughs> and so on. But again, I did. The search was not to, and we had also we were supportive of Barry Weiss. She came to campus a while ago too, uh, which again, some people you know we had to kick protest, uh, protesters out of the room and so on. We're not looking for the controversy. We're looking to have you know ideas debated and presented and discussed in a in a in, in this important forum. That's the forum that's the university. And yeah, if you are a little bit outside what campus mainstream is, that's going to be natural. Do you take that as 
an indicator, though, that you're doing something right if you have protesters in the room or you stir up controversy around something? Like, do you take it as an indicator that you're saying something interesting or is it an annoyance that you kind of have to deal with that to have the conversations that you're having? How do you think about it? I mean, the, the, it's, I would be lying if I if I if I would say that the controversy doesn't this doesn't sort of like shows us that ha- this is important. What we're mm-hmm. doing is important, right? For sure. Uh, I don't like the fact that people get arrested sometimes. I don't like the fact that cops need to be involved because it's like a, a waste of time and money. You know, <laughs> put an event and now we have to call cops in order to you know staff the event. My staff. I'm sure gets annoyed by the fact that they're getting emails calling them all sorts of names and like like what am I what is this like, you know it's, it's not nice right I mean when you get 600 emails in two days I think that happened calling me a genocidal person is like which that event? was the Israeli the, was, that was that was the the, the Israel uh, you problem. got 600 emails? something of that order yeah so How there was did a campaign that many people feel so strongly campaign. that they had to email you yeah. And they were wow. emailing me and some person in the president's office at the university calling for the event to be canceled. And you, you know, get in trouble for that? Well, that's a long story. <laughs> but, but but you know, um yes, there was a that there's some things that have happened in the past couple of years that mm-hmm. essentially the university is saying, Oh, can you not, you know, maybe you have don't. to do this again. <laughs> exactly. Right. So because again, the administrator that's not doesn't believe in the need for those ideas to exist on campus, mm-hmm. saying this is only annoying me. This is not really creating, you know, the, the fact that the university became so monolithic, I think shows you that the people who run universities are not people that believe, truly believe in the need for, you know, discussions. And because otherwise they wouldn't become. I mean, they would have done something to avoid the sort of monopolization of ideas on campus, right? Well, so then is a is a is a circular problem, right? So so mm-hmm. anybody that tells me, oh, this is a good university president, I mean, that's a lie. There's no such thing as a good university president currently, because they are all part of the same. You know, they're all the same. The universities are all the same. They're all very much in one sort of box of orthodoxy. And any university president went through a career of being, you know, successful inside of that bureaucracy, mm-hmm. and they're they're an entity of that bureaucracy. So if the bureaucracy needs reform, I don't trust any of the people that cur- that came from the bureaucracy to reform it. It's just not going to happen, right? Um, I mean, there's not, that's not saying that an individuals are not nice people. That's not what it is. It's just like, I don't trust bureaucrats, <laughs> generally speaking. And if I see one, I'm like, well, I'm going to be skeptical of. So <laughs> yes, they would prefer that the controversy wasn't there. They would prefer that those things didn't exist. But not to the point that they're giving you so much trouble that you have to shut down what you're doing. We're still in Texas. And um, mm. it helps. I think if I try to do this at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, I would not be able to, mm-hmm. or any of the UC uh, schools, I would not be able to. Um, I think that you know, given that we're here in Texas and 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 we we were able to get a little bit of attention from from the the people who help run, runs the state, I think that protects us a little bit. I wanna. There's two different things that you just said that I want to talk about. First of all, the no good university presidents thing. Mm-hmm. That's a very interesting statement. I don't want you to let you just like <laughs> off the hook without backing that up a little bit more because I think it's important to define, and this is in some ways a very much a values judgment, but in your opinion, what is the definition of a good university president? What is the thing that we don't have any of, but it would be nice to have? And right. then we'll come back and we'll talk about the Texas thing because that's also interesting. Right. Um, okay. So that's that's a Tough one, but let's let, let me first rephrase what I just said. Uh, there are, of course, because you know we can make a generalization, offhand generalization of of uh, we have seen some examples of very good leadership in universities recently in the country. Mm-hmm. Just a, a highlight of it, I think maybe the best one that uh, that we've seen is Mitch Daniels at Purdue University. Uh, he, I think, was there for about ten years or so as president, and he stepped down a couple of years ago, and and he was an outsider, right? He came in, I mean, he was governor of Indiana, he was a uh, uh, in the Reagan White House, he was, um, I don't remember what he was right before uh, becoming university president, but he was not uh, somebody that came from that from that tradition, from that bureaucracy to become the president. He was a business person for a long time. So I think he came in and he thought about, okay, what it is, what are the, as a CEO of that giant institution, I mean, Purdue is an enormous, people sometimes don't realize the size and 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 budget uh, of these institutions. We're talking about billions of dollars of, a, of an institution they run, right? Um, and I think he focused a lot on, on the actual output of what that company is. Right? So a lot of companies, again, if you think about 
the, 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 the sort of free market, the way the free market works is that you have the price signal, right? The price signal being the things that if I'm able to sell a good product, I might be able to charge more. If I don't, well, if I don't have a good product, I'm not gonna sell. So you have the feedback from the consumers that are, they're, they're are, are interacting with you. At a quasi-governmental system like the, the universities, you don't have that. So you don't have the discipline of the markets forcing you to be efficient. Nobody fails. There's no failing university. I mean, again, there exist the little ones and that mm -hmm. you don't hear about much, but, but of the big state schools, the schools that you know about, nobody fails. These are all quasi-monopolies, right? So, you know, the University of Texas has people lining at the door wanting to get in, and we, are, we never try to sell more of our product. We don't ever try to increase our seats. Why is that? I think Mitch was somebody that did it differently. Like, no, if I have a good, first of all, let me define the product very carefully. Let me work on making this product as efficient as possible. And let me try to get this product to more people. And he did that. Uh, in a lot of ways, he did that very successfully. So, but that's not what typically gets done. There's no, um, I don't think university presidents typically see themselves as working for the people of the state necessarily. They think about themselves as, you know, managing this thing that exists, that has prestige and trying to protect the prestige and not necessarily do the things that I think are, um, would be the most efficient way to take that institution and provide value for, for the state that they're serving. And even if you're a private institution, I think that there's more than just the, the boards that, you know, you're working for. I think that the, the fact that they are subsidized with the federal government, there is a general um, sort of, you know, goal that you should be thinking about uh, that that we're falling short. I mean, the, there's so many, the controversies are out there for us to, <laughs> we don't need to mention names, right? But it's it's uh, uh, from the very top of the list, I think to the very bottom, we have a lot of uh, uh, underachieving uh, leadership in university um, uh, president's office. Okay, I lied. We'll come back to the Texas thing in a minute because okay. there's more here that's really interesting. If the incentives are off for people inside of these sort of artificially supported, highly subsidized monopolies, mm -hmm. what would universities look like if that skewed incentive structure didn't exist and presidents were working within a set of incentives that we're maybe less focused on just maintaining the prestige and a little bit more about actually serving the people mm -hmm. who were paying for the university and sending their children to the university and students of the university. What would that, I imagine that system would look very different than what we've ended up with in that, higher education. That That's what I would, I would think. And, and it, it's um, my sort of hunch is that would get, would have things that would be very flexible in terms of the deliverables that a university would have in order to provide people with packages of knowledge, right? So the packages would look very different. You'd have very different ve kinds of bundles of packages as opposed to just this, un this one thing, this one box, oh, it's a four-year degree, and you come in, you have this prescription of general requirements and so on and so forth. It's not necessarily, you know, uh, you look at the statistics of the number of people that tend to work in the major that they, that they, they pursue is like, you know, it was very, very small. This week in the Wall Street Journal, there was a big article about a large survey that came out mm -hmm. talking about um, percentage of people that are em underemployed coming out of college. And so you, again, so there's so much of that that we see routinely that somehow the product is not delivering what's supposed to be delivering, that I think you'd have a very different kind of product if you had a, um, a more flex a system that was actually very aligned with the, uh, if, you, the if, if this was seen as a product and people were consuming the product for the right reason as opposed to the certification, right? The stamp in the forehead says, hey, I can do this and therefore uh, I'm somebody that should be should be higher, for example, as opposed to actually acquiring the knowledge, right? So so if the signaling model, signaling model which, which people uh, like Brian, I guess, writes about the fact that the main um, uh, reason why folks that end up making more money and so on by going to college is that they can signal to the workplace that they are able to put one foot in front of the other, they comply, they can do stuff and so on, rather than the human capital story, which is like, oh no, they spend time there and they learn, they acquire so much skills, so many skills that then they can use those skills effectively to become more productive. I think that the, the evidence is that the signaling is very strong, the skills are not there. So this thing, if it's just signaling, you could have do it very differently. And if it is human capital, again, I think you could do it very differently, much more, much more flexible way. So I've spent a lot of time, you're, you're addressing one of my favorite sets of problems. 
I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. So I I don't remember how much I told you about my background when we originally met. So I grew up homeschooled. I skipped college and went to work for a startup apprenticeship program called Praxis that was helping young people land apprenticeships doing non-technical roles like sales and marketing and operations at startups instead of going to business school. And the idea was that when you go to business school, often you still come out with, you, like you said, you have the strong signal. I have this degree from this prestigious university. I was good enough to get into the university and graduate. Therefore, I'm good enough for you too. But there was often a very large gap between the theoretical knowledge and applied knowledge, like knowing how to actually go into an entry-level job and be useful day in, day out to an employer. And so that was like the core problem on, so the founder of this company, the, the a problem on the employer side is that all of his friends who were running businesses were having a really hard time hiring entry-level talent. And on the student side, the price of college kept increasing, student debt keep, kept inflating, kids were coming out of college and still having a hard time getting jobs. And it seemed like there was a better way. And so I was trying to figure out how to be successful without college because I was this homeschooled kid where I was like, the internet is giving me free access to all the information I would get in college. College no longer has a monopoly on information. Surely it doesn't have a monopoly on the gatekeeping to life success. Like surely that also can be separated out from the university system. And I didn't really know how. I was like, I'll go work for this company that's teaching people how to do it and then I'll maybe figure it out. Um, and so but I, I bet spent- you saw how difficult that is. How difficult what is? The, 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 they have the gate. The gatekeeping is still very strong. It is very right. strong. Um, I'm a little, I have a very, a, a bit of a bias in the, just the, the lived experience that I have because so many of my interests are in places that really don't care about degrees. So for me, it's never been an impediment. No one's ever asked. No one's ever cared. If anything, it's it's a perk that I don't right. have one because it's a cool story. Um, but yes, in, in many aspects of the world, the gatekeeping is very strong. Um but I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Like we were designing a program that was intended to be an alternative to college. And we were very aware that we were one option of many. There are many different ways of doing this. And so this kind of unbundling of the services that college is providing, everything from signaling to knowledge transfer to career readiness to networking, like each one of those things can be separated out and provided more effectively. That I've just spent a lot of time, you know, thinking through what the different possible options might be in terms of efficiency and like different types of outcomes. And I'm really curious what you think, you know, what is like, what are the places that you feel like the university system gets it right in terms of the four year degree approach? Or is it entirely arbitrary? Um, Like it doesn't not make sense anywhere. And if it's entirely arbitrary everywhere, then, you know, you're working inside of the system. You're seeing it it at a very intimate level, but you're also thinking about it in a very analytical and kind of removed way in some sense. It's like, it sounds like you don't have nearly as much of an attachment to the legacy of the system as some people might. So you can be more critical of it from the inside. I'm really curious, like what elements of it you think are inherently correct, like what it's getting right, or if all of it ought to be rethought. And if not all of it, then what are the most important pieces to be rethinking? Um, Okay. So Here's one thing that I think can can really be rethought and it would be very beneficial to to be done differently. We there's a lot of wasted time um, <laughs> when when it comes to the life of a student in the the four years. Forget about again. There's so much. It, it, it's so complicated when you look at what the what what the experience is now. College, right? In the in America, in particular. I mean, I, I didn't grow up in the U.S. I grew up in Brazil and and went to college in Brazil. Okay. Uh, and in Brazil, we don't have the residential model of colleges. Okay. Oh. So you know, how does that work? Well, I go to college. I live in my own. I mean, there's no such thing as college having a police force or like a counseling for. No, college is a place where you go learn stuff because you live probably with your parents, or maybe you rent an apartment by yourself if you move town or something, find some friends and so on. So you're an adult. People, you know, the notion of calling people kids in college, it was foreign to me. And there's never, I never saw a person in Brazil calling somebody a kid when they're 18 and go to college. And they go to college, you're an adult now, right? This is a serious thing, you're doing a serious thing. And so, so then, so I think that's the number one bundle that is 
highly problematic in the system, mm -hmm. which is like we're outsourcing this growing up period to this, you know, club med full of bureaucrats worrying about all sorts of things that are like, you know, it's weird. It's just very weird. It's like a, a, a the cost of that is just unbelievable, right? Well, so that's one thing that I think I would prefer to see a separation of it. And, and, and uh, the residential model is problematic in my view. Second, in, in that residential model, people are learning all sorts of things, growing up, finding relationships, figuring out how to, to be a human and so on, right? Which is totally fine. It's part of life, it's a moment in life. But when it comes to the content that they are trying to acquire, I mean, again, a lot of wasted time, right? You should think about the number of hours a week a student is dedicating himself to herself to 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 to, to classroom time is what maybe twelve hours a week. I mean, twelve hours a week. And these days, if you look at the surveys that talk about how many hours they are spending outside for every hour in the classroom, it's it's half a week of work, maybe. So. That seems to me, a, I mean, at that point in time where your brain is in such high power mode, I mean, for, for the curious person, that is probably the best time of your life to acquire knowledge. Your brain is really, really good at acquiring knowledge and processing information at that point in time. And you're just asking it to do it for like maybe half of the week. It's just insane, insane. So one way in which I think we could change things dramatically is to make it into something that, you know, looks like the military in terms of, okay, do you want to learn computer science? All right, so we're gonna for one year, and I'm not saying that's forever, but for one year, you're gonna spend an enormous amount of time in front of a computer, getting tutorials, whatever, whatever it is, that, the, the way we're gonna do that. But you're gonna work really hard. This is a full-time job now. By the end of this one year, you're gonna know a lot about you know, computer science. And it's possible, we see that happening in companies when people graduate and go and sometimes have to learn on the job Companies have training programs and so on, right? So, so I think that kind of intensity, I think you can do it and 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 really make sure that people master a particular topic. And then you have time. If you're gonna do this for four years, in four years, you probably have time to do three or four topics in incredibly depth if you really focus and dedicate yourself to. Um, but maybe you don't need to do four, maybe you just need to do one and that's totally fine. You got out of, you know, after, after something appeared like that. And, and again, when I say a year, uh, uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to sign up ahead of time for saying, I'm gonna do this for the entire year. But I think you have the ability to build, if you, if you build modules where each module is in very, very intensive in a sense that requires a lot from you to master the module, right? You could have a series of modules available and people would have to, okay, once you choose the module, game on, this is serious now. It's not gonna be something you waltz into class, listen, scroll your phone while doing it, walk out, maybe find a way to answer multiple choice questions. So, the games they're being played right now in terms of, I pretend to teach you, you pretend to be learning, you get an A, if you don't work hard, you get maybe an A minus, <laughs> and then you get out of here. It's just like, it's to no, to no one's benefit. It's really to no one's benefit right now. Um, and I think the, the, the sad part to me is that the knowledge is there. The human capital the universities attract in terms of the faculty and so on is actually very high. It's good, it's strong in a lot of areas. So that is, I think is, a, you know, taking advantage of that to really create better, more more, uh, more targeted products that allows people to really acquire the knowledge those people have to, to, to have available and think hard about, and I don't know the answer to that, the way to transmit the knowledge is not an easy thing. There's lots of different uh, ideas, there's lots of different methods and so on. And But again, I do know one thing that, oh, we're gonna have an intro class with 300 students in the room and I'm gonna go there, I don't know anybody. And you know, just that's not the right way either. You know, I can, honestly, a lot of the classes that I've taught over my 15 year career, a robot can do it. And not because I'm not particularly good at it, I think I'm decent at it. However, it's repetitive, is something that, you know, didn't change very much because the topics, a lot of intro topics are very stable, right? Mm -hmm. So if you spend a little bit of time producing high quality content in a different format, now you open myself up to become more involved into t tutoring students in those high intense experience that I was describing before, right? But but none of it is available. There's no innovation. There's no thinking about 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 it uh, from from the from the very beginning. So you know, and and the incentives are, are all messed up. And I I truly think that the model that we have is is legacy, accidental, and not really something that if we were to start from scratch, it would look anything like that. Your comment about this being something that a robot could do, 
is very prescient <laughs> over the past I was on purpose. <laughs> 12 months or so. I see more innovation happening actually at the K-12 level yeah. than in the college level. Uh, not necessarily inside of the government bureaucracy of education, but there are some people who are doing really interesting work in the private sector around building AI tools that can support kids learning, but also building schools mm -hmm. that employ those tools. And we know that AI is in some ways better equipped to teach kids than the teacher in front of the classroom model. Like we have decades of learning science research to back this up, that kids learn better when they're able to have very spaced repetition, forced recall, information processing, like the, the format that Duolingo employs to mm -hmm. teach you a new language is more effective in some ways than having somebody in front of a classroom talking to the entire group when half the kids can't remember what they learned last week and the other half the kids are bored out of their mind because they already know all of this. We know that that works more efficiently and you just can't, there's no way to have a class of 30 kids and have every kid recalling information at exactly the optimal time exactly. for their brain to create the neural pathways to anchor the information. You can't do it. And so it's a pretty compelling argument. It's a pretty clear cut argument that you can use technology to solve for that. You can create apps that just like use machine learning mm -hmm. to help kids access the correct information at the correct time. Like you can algorithmically start to map out where these things, I mean, you, they're, I mean, Duolingo is the easiest to recall example because most people have downloaded I mean, I, it at I'll some say, point. I'll say Khan tried. Academy, is, yeah, Khan is, Academy. Is, is, is like, you know, a superior product than most intro math classes in colleges. In colleges. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's, it, it's, it's not, I mean, <laughs> it's impressive what, what Khan Academy is. It's oh, very impressive. It and, and, and when you see kids going through that, you realize, wow, this is actually a really good product. And, and when you think about the quality of the instruction that you get in a generic public school on the same topic, it's not going to be that good. It's just not going to be that good. And you need to point it out, like it's not going to be at the speed of the kid. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be customized to the speed and the necessity to recall when, oh, you didn't master this thing, go back and do it again. And, you know, so so none of that is available in a classroom environment. And you're absolutely right. There's no reason for us not to take advantage of that model and say, listen, if I need you to now do whatever, it's calculus one, you can do it. You don't need a professor like some random RA mm -hmm. that is working really on their PhD. They're not really, they don't really want to be in front of the classroom, but they kind of have to because they're funding. The professor doesn't really want to do the intro class because no. it's like, it's kind of boring. Yeah, you've done it. If you've it's, done it a couple of times, it ter sounds terrible. All of it is 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 is, is set up in the, in the wrong way. And we have now technology that can really do it in a much better way. I mean, Duolingo, I, what I like about the example of Duolingo is that Again, universities have all, almost all majors have some kind of requirement of a foreign language, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of universities have. I mean, in the US, I don't meet a lot of people that speak anything other than English. Highly educated people. Just that doesn't happen because, you know, it, the incentives are not really there. English is something that you can use everywhere. Yeah. You know, I had to learn English, right? Because I grew up speaking Portuguese, <laughs> not a super useful language. Uh -huh. So learning language was very important to me. Mm -hmm. But for an American, eh, it's kind of important if you want to be a culture person, but like not really important. You can get away with speaking English your entire life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the the review the sort of like outcome of that is that nobody does really speak. I mean, very few Americans speak a uh, uh, master a second language in a, in a in a way that's meaningful. But all of them went through college and took a class on it. So what purpose does that serve? Is to employ a bunch of people in these language departments and but for no reason. And again, I'm not saying that I don't want to have a language department because there's some research, some study that might be needed there. But that's a separate question. It's not a question of educating people, right? And all of it can be replaced by Duolingo. Literally all of it. I mean, the, the 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 data on this, on the research on language acquisition on schools, I mean, it's almost negative. <laughs> the results are negative. They're not even zero. It's negative. Brian has a lot of good 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 uh, uh, um, sort of summary of that in, in his book, the case against education, right? So yeah, it's 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 there. It's in front of us, and the only reason why it's not deployed is because you have a giant bureaucracy. You have a giant set of constraints, legacy constraints. 
uh, stopping people from 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 doing the right thing. It's also, I I truly believe, and this there's a contingency here, which is the bureaucracy has to allow the shift to happen. And that's the wild card to me. Like, will will the bu- bureaucracy move enough for this to happen? But if we were truly taking the most efficient approach and the most effective approach to teaching, we'll use Khan Academy again as an example because that's that's such a great case study for this. Salman Khan is a brilliant instructor. He's so good at it. He's so clear and so concise and he frames things in like very simple and easy to follow terms. He's world class at explaining mathematical concepts in a way that's easy to understand. He's way better at it than almost anyone else who teaches mathematics. There's a reason why he is a household name and everybody knows what Khan Academy is. The idea of having that kind of talent existing in the world and instead learning from whoever happens to be best at teaching mathematics in your town is going to... I mean, if you get lucky, that's what you get. get. That's not what you get. You you might not even get the best person. Exactly. But whoever happens to (laughs) To rise to the top in the like talent funnel of looking like acquiring the job of being a mathematics instructor would be like having a, you know, world famous musician. Like you have, I don't know, um, who's, who's a singer. That's amazing. Give me an example. Uh, Whitney Houston. There we go. Brilliant voice. It's like you have Whitney Houston, but you can't listen to her. You have to listen to whoever happens to be the best singer in your town. No, that's exactly right. And it makes no sense, right? It makes no sense. And that person in your town can be helpful in your process. Like you could have this sort of tutorial. I mean, that's what yeah. I, 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 use, I use the word tutorial as a, mm-hmm. as a way that, that, yeah, you have this sort of world-class person creating tools and things, exposing you to some ideas. And yeah, surely you're going to have some questions. Surely this sort of sometimes the you know, asking a question to a human in front of you can be a useful thing. But use that person now as an additional resource. Mm -hmm. That that, that person now can serve a lot of different people, like running giant office hours, for example, right? So maybe, you know, that that kind of uh, 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 modality can can, can be put to to, to use. And yeah, the person has has something to add, but now you're also getting from the very best. Yeah, and the person can also, it's, it's far more engaging, at least in my experience, to like work with someone one on one on a specific problem that they're addressing than standing up and giving the same talk over and over again i i find that i i would be a terrible academic because i find that incredibly boring i would not be good at that part giving the same like teaching the same course like i teach it once and i'd have a ton of fun and then the next year i'd be like wait we're doing this again, again. <laughs> um, i could never work in i could never be a public school teacher probably for that reason but working one on one with people is super fun cuz even if people are encountering similar problems again and again there's the just dy- dynamism of the individual use case and the individual circumstance that's really fun to work through so you can kind of uncouple the role of the lecturer and the role of the coach mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you don't have to be the best in the world at teaching spanish you can outsource it to an app but you can be really good at tutoring pronunciation and helping people figure out the weird quirks and like they can't roll their R's or they're having, you know, the the V and B sounds are confusing to them and you're talking them through it. And you're able, because that's, I think, probably one of the biggest criticisms of a language learning app is that you can technically complete everything, but you're not getting the The like coaching on the pronunciation. So you can have an individual who does that. And then who's also helping you think through, well, like maybe we should focus in this area because you want to like your goal is to learn how to read Harry Potter in Spanish or something. Um, Or maybe you want to be conversant so that you can go to Mexico City that later this year and actually, you know, talk to the locals and like order food and ask for directions and things or actually have a real conversation and not just do those things Um, and like supplementing that. Right. Um, Oh, you're interested in like crime tv shows you should go watch narcos without the the, the subtitles, subtitles and actually yeah. try to understand like that's my recommendation for you. you can give that tutor or that tailored instruction without having them and and, and you can also take advantage of networks in a mm-hmm. way that that you know affinities right like maybe it's not just you in the tutor but maybe there's three students that are doing similar things in different places mm-hmm. that were easy enough for us to connect them through either you know just basic zoom or a vr you know as you were moving to and so on so there's so much that we can do and and have these little pods created like 
affinity based pods, right? Mm -hmm. so, 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 again, it's just like lack of imagination uh, uh, and, and, and constraints. Constraints, I mean, bureaucratic, governmental, um, constraints stopping from happening. To me, as someone who grew up homeschooled, utilizing resources on the internet to learn, like I kind of grew up with YouTube and with Google, I was able to, like as these tools were coming online and becoming proliferated with content, I my capacity to use them was also increasing. Right. Um, it's very foreign to me. That's part of why I didn't go to college. It's very foreign to me, the thought of having to sit in lecture halls and take gen ed requirements to eventually, you know, get a degree in something that I wasn't even sure I was going to use for any particular career path. But but even, even I mean, that was also part of the cost-benefit analysis that I was right. weighing. Like, is this worth the money? For me, it wasn't. But the idea of being in a classroom. Let me, let me go back to, yeah, to, to, to one place uh, uh, that I think the current, because you asked me, I was just thinking about one of the questions you asked me was about what were the things that, you know, we think that work well, right? So we, a lot of the things that we're talking about here are things that we can do because they are essentially software, right? Mm -hmm. Mathematics is a software that mm -hmm. we can just download to, our, if we can download to our brain and figure out how to use it, but it's a software, right? So, yeah. so I'm not figuring out dexterity with my hands. I'm not running experiments with it or anything like that. It's just a language that we're learning. And there's a lot of things that we can learn and these, ma these modalities that we're talking about are really good for that. But some people need to become, you know, physics, uh, uh, nuclear engineers and, and, and chemists and biologists and doctors and so on. And in those spaces, there is a physical component mm -hmm. that you're going to need to expose students to the sort of like, you know, how to pipe at something in a dish and how to, you know, um, I don't know, blow something up if you're going to be <laughs> a, a mining engineer. Or, or And and so universities have this, the, that's where I think the, the infrastructure of universities can be best put to, to, to use. Mm -hmm. And if we're, so, you know, it's not to destroy the whole thing, but focus right. on that, do that really well. Make sure you get the right people admitted to go do those things after they complete their knowledge acquisition in other areas from a more flexible modality set, right? But now, okay, now you're in the track of, you know, you need the modules to become a, a nuclear engineer. Okay, so now you're gonna spend a lot of time in our labs because that's gonna be very, very important for you to do things here, right? Um, and because yeah, those are gonna be needed. Those are gonna be very hard, I think, to outsource to a different, to a different platform, for example. How much, I don't know how quantifiable this is, but how much of, the historical precedent of what universities do, both in terms of the services they provide, but also the structure, is outdated for the 21st century with both the level of just internet access, but also technology and AI and other tools that we have at our access. How much of it do you think is no longer relevant? Um, in terms of the content that they teach or, or just the structure? The structure, the content, the services provided, maybe this is the broadest right, umbrella. The broadest. Oh, that's hard to 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 quantify. I mean, I do think that. Um, so, I I used to think a lot about you know because when you have a job at a system that you have a lot of questions about, <laughs> you have to be a little bit like, what am I doing, right? <laughs> uh, why why do I why do I get this paycheck at the end of the month? And you know, if I don't truly believe in a lot of these things, so there's a couple of things that I, that I so the way I sort of made peace with it, I, I think there's three pillars that the university, um, a faculty member like me, is kind of engaging on on a mm -hmm. daily basis at the university. So is knowledge creation, knowledge curation, and and sort of maintenance, and then knowledge uh, passing on. Right? So there's three things that we try to do. We try to create knowledge. The, set, the middle one is the one that you don't hear very much. Typically you hear people talking about, oh, you create knowledge and we teach, right? So it's really accidental in my mind that the people that are creating knowledge are the ones that also are sending the knowledge, it, teaching the knowledge. That's sort of like, and as we talked about here, there's not a real, you know, direct correlation between being good in one and being good in the other. That's not necessarily the case, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the 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 sort of like innovation in certain parts of the curriculum when things evolve and now we're in the first 21st century and so on, people that are in the business of creating new knowledge are gonna be faster in figuring out what's important to pass on to the next generation. So I think that being having them associated in the process is, to some degree is an important thing. Mm -hmm. Now the problem is that how do you how do you weigh things, right? Uh, and 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 how involved you want to have those two missions be, and and that's where I think we we, we get it wrong because we don't have we never sat down and tried to optimize for that. It was just again a little bit of an accident of of history. <laughs> now the middle one is also the part that I mentioned, keeping the knowledge alive is also very very important. 
curating the knowledge is something that if we don't have, you know, the knowledge in the internet, a lot of it, right? But it's very hard for you to figure out, um, okay, so what is very important? That is difficult. That's more difficult. There's a lot out there. You can spend your entire life going through a lot of things that are really not important. Mm -hmm. And some people have a special knowledge that can tell you, okay, here are the things that you really need to know about this topic. I think that curation is very important. But again, that curation can be done in a much more efficient way than, than we do now. But in the knowledge creation part, most people, most professors who go through their careers and not actually invent or create anything of actual meaning. Because it's hard to come up with an idea that you know, is world changing, right? Um, but the the process of attempting to do so is a process that is like, it's almost kicking the tires of a car and making sure that, you know, the, the knowledge is alive. The existing body of knowledge, you're trying to move and you're not really being successful, but that thing is alive. And then all of a sudden, boom, it moves because somebody really innovates in the direction. But keeping it alive is part of the process as well. But again, I don't think that activity is necessarily something that has to be done in conjunction with with, with the teaching. So um, I think some association between the, the 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 pursuit of knowledge that universities do um, and the teaching is, is necessary, but I think it can be much more uh, diffused than it is right now. I think that we could have in Texas, honestly speaking, could have like, let's say the state of Texas has I don't know how many universities we have in our state system. A lot. But we have, I think, you know, we're talking about billions of dollars, $40 billion a year is more or less what we spend as an aggregate in the state. Um, I think if we had maybe two institutes of research and those the, select the best ones across all of our institutions, put them in one place, give them resources and focus on knowledge creation in those places, and then connect those to develop curriculum and all the, you know, and then through more smart modalities that we talked about mm -hmm. to deploy knowledge in all sorts of different ways, I think it would be a much more efficient and much more, uh, a much, a much smarter way to do what we try to do now in replicating campuses with giant infrastructure everywhere. I don't think we need that many of those and we don't we definitely don't need to, 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 we just don't have enough top, you know, world-class this, that, and the other to be everywhere. Focus on the ones that you do have, provide them with the resources, give them the authority, then to now really think about what needs to be taught and 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 that would be, I think, much better. I know that you're using Texas as an example mm -hmm. in this context and differently from how you're using it previously, but I promised that we'd come back to Texas. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna close this loop. Your comment about having the types of conversations that you have at Salem Center in Texas mm -hmm. and perhaps not being able to have them in other places. How much is Texas truly a bastion of free speech and free inquiry? Like how how marked is the difference between Texas and maybe the coastal states or perhaps the rest of the country in your in your experience? Um, well, I think there's there's the main element I in my view is that because we are in a state, that uh, the the political fabric of that state, the sort of uh, general opinions and values that people have are antagonistic to the university. I think the university is very, again, if you just simplify things into right and left, right? Mm -hmm. The university is super left, the state is not, right? So that creates a balancing act that, you know, just the students that come to, to the University of Texas tend to be less, they're very progressive on average, but they're less so than the students that are going into, let's say, you know, um, SUNY, Stony Brook, right? <laughs> um, so so that's, that's uh, uh, I think that creates a moderation that, that does moderate things a little bit. And then on top of it, you have, because you have uh, uh, the sort of people overseeing the institution tends to be on the right, that creates a little bit of a constraint of, of being like, listen, I cannot just completely go in one direction without paying some, you know, there's some incentives to maintain certain things in place, right? I'm not saying that Republicans are the, are the good guys here in any way. So I think if you had a situation where you have a, 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 an agency, the university, that is very right-wing and that lives in a state that's also right-wing, well, then they'll be you know, monolithic in the same way. But if you're a right-wing institution in a left-wing state, then that would balance things out a little bit. The problem is that we don't have that analogy. That doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a right-wing university in a blue state. I mean, that doesn't exist, right? <laughs> uh, so I think what we see right now is that universities in red states are actually behave a little bit better. 
because they they have a, an influence of the the sort of like illiberalism that the left has brought into universities is something that gets counterweighted a little bit by by you know states they are run from from the right. Today's episode is sponsored by my friends at the John Galt Mortgage Company. My friends Mitch and Tim launched the John Galt Mortgage Company last year after spending years working in the real estate world and realizing that mortgages are way more expensive than they need to be. Most people don't realize how much extra profit is baked into the cost of a mortgage. Most real estate agents don't even know. So Mitch and Tim decided to build a new kind of mortgage, one where they voluntarily cap their profit on every transaction. And by lowering their commission, they pass the savings on to you, the buyer, in the form of a lower interest rate than what everyone else is charging. I talked to Mitch and Tim just the other week, and they told me about multiple examples of customers who are saving literally hundreds of dollars a month on their mortgage payments compared to what they would be paying with a traditional lender. Mitch and Tim are old friends of mine who believe in economic liberty, entrepreneurship, and financial independence. They also named their company the John Galt Mortgage Company, which tells you everything you need to know about them. If you're in the market for a house, you can find out more about what they're doing at www.johngaltmortgage.com, or you can find a link to their site down in the show notes. Okay, back to the interview. That makes sense. All right, we're going to pivot because we haven't gotten to the part yet where I talk about why I'm so excited to have a statistician yeah. on the show. Uh, and there's a lot here that I want to talk to you about. So we're talking about the structure of the university system perhaps being very outdated for the technological advances of the 21st century. We're sort of using this very 19th and 20th century social technology in a world where the actual hard technologies have far outpaced in terms of capacity of how we can transfer knowledge and how we can access information. Um, but I don't think that that's the only thing that's shifted in not just the tools that we have accessible to us for delivering education, but also the needs of like the things that we should be learning about. We also are working inside of a curriculum structure that was designed a long time ago and has evolved some, but not extensively, maybe more at a university level than a K-12 level. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the universities are more agile in terms of adding departments and areas of study as they become relevant. The K-12 system is pretty calcified. Right. Um, we live in a very different world than we used to. And it is a world full of statistics and a world full of data. And I don't think that people are very well equipped to navigate that. Statistics is an elective. You don't even have to study it to in get K through high in school. K right, yeah, right. In, yeah, in K-12, it's an elective. Um, you can graduate from high school and have no idea what statistics is besides something on the guidance counselor's list of prospective classes that you did not check off <laughs> as wanting to take. That's all it was to you. And yet we're bombarded with data everywhere. The media is throwing data at us. Um, people on podcasts are throwing data at us. Um, you know, any new current event is full of data. You know, such and such number of people are, you know, are dying of gun violence or are fighting COVID this month or are unemployed or have been killed by this, you know, this conflict in a foreign country. And the numbers all sound terrible, but we don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. We have to take someone else's word for it who has studied to statistics because we don't know how to assess it. I think we don't properly appreciate how important statistics is. And I'm very curious to hear your take on this. I could be wrong. I am not a statistician. No, you're very right. You're very right. I think that. this is important. Um, the sort of like data literacy mm -hmm. is is really bad. It's really bad. And and um, we can talk a little bit about when I see freshmen at UT and I want to hear about and, this, yeah. But but like before that, uh, um, and you're absolutely right that 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 was not something that we spend enough time teaching people to be versed and understanding 
of, of reading numbers, understanding what they can tell you, what they cannot tell you, understanding variability, which is something that is very, very hard for people to grasp. Um, and But I will say that I'm not so sure about the K through 12 curriculum. Mm -hmm. And and I, I've seen at some point in time what the AP stats looks like, and it's, it's not particularly great <laughs> what that <laughs> curriculum is, you know, but um, in colleges that has, we've seen a, a, um, a good movement of, I think calculus used to be a class that almost every college ever in the country, every major, oh, we need to do a calculus, you know, being college, one of the things, one of the rite of passages of college is to take you know, a calculus class or some sort of math requirement that more often than not was at least an introduction to calculus. What is the argument for that? Is it is it that we live in like a physics driven world and you have to understand calculus to be able to navigate? Like we live in a very scientific world. What is what is the case? I, I think for it's this? a legacy of of yeah of the scientific revolution and Newton, right? And 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 it's it's a, it's a such a bu important building block of so many things that we're able to do mm -hmm. uh, and understand about the world, the physical world around us, not only the physical world, but the digital world as well, right? That I think, you know, but the, but there's a huge disconnect between the very basics of what you're doing calculus and the, all these applications that at some level have calculus, you know, as a source of, or as an important building block to it. I don't think most classes people actually are able to make connect the dots at all about what they're seeing in the classroom and how that actually helps them when they are playing their, in their smartphone. Mm -hmm. I really don't think that's a, that's a, people can make that connection. Whereas I think something like statistics that has become you now in a lot of places has become a potential alternative in the curriculum, um, if not replacing a lot of places, adding as a, as a requirement as well. is something that you can see the connection on a daily basis, as you're pointing out, is math, is quantitative, it's actually very hard in a in a in a conceptual way, not necessarily in a in a technical way like calculus can be, but it's 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 way more useful. It's way more useful to immediately give you the ability to navigate the world around you in a in a better way. So we see a, I see a lot of positives, uh, a positive movement in that. So so we, we uh, I was mentioning to you that we call this now data science mm -hmm. is the word that I think people are using as the the requirements and this class that are being created sounds a little bit more attractive than statistics. Is you think I about like statistics, statistics better? Well, probably. I don't know. I think that people <laughs> when, you, when I tell people that oh I'm a statistician, they look at you like oh. You know, the, the air comes out of the room a little bit. Somehow there's this notion that you count baskets in the games. Like, no, 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 that's not what it is at all. Um, so data science seems to be something there, or analytics is the other mm -hmm. word that we see people using a lot. Um, I think that the realization that data is everywhere, we can collect and store data everywhere, and therefore we can learn a lot from data is something that is, is, is people, I mean, businesses for sure realize that. And that's kind of making making a, a, a positive move in curricula across the country uh, for, for colleges and majors. So so that's good. So that, that's good. Now, long way to go still in making sure that people are, again, because no, one thing is to say, well, that's an important set of topics for us to teach. But then how do we teach it? Are we able to do it well? Are we able to deliver it in a way that sticks with people? And that's where I think we still fail miserably. Well, I think statistics in my mind is directly correlated with the the great internet buzz term critical thinking everybody loves talking about critical thinking uh it can be a very nebulous right. idea that gets batted around um but if you want to go down that rabbit hole of like how do you look at something and not just take it at face value but assess what is happening and and what the variables at play are and how you how that aligns with your values and how you think about it knowing how to think like a statistician, even if you're not trained as one at a deep level, I think is necessary to be able to go to any depth with a lot of the things that people want to be able to think critically about. And I'm curious, I don't know if how easy it is to compare contrast, like the benefits of like if you're if you're never going to use calculus and you're never going to formally use statistics like you're not going into any career field that requires either of those things there's still a difference in the the type of thinking that each mathematical discipline opens up right when you learn how to think conceptually about calculus it changes your perceptive perception of the world around you but also the creative potential within that world and when you learn about statistics, it opens up your perception of how to assess all of the different pieces of data that 
are thrown at you, but also that you can be collecting and studying and assessing. Is there a comparison of the two types of thinking, like sort of the the way it shapes the mind to study one or the other, or perhaps both in tandem? So I I, I would have a hard time answering the question on the way it shapes the mind, right? I mm-hmm. uh, This may be a terrible question. I'm a little, I don't I'm know. A, I'm a, because I'm a little skeptical of this, uh, uh, again, the data... <laughs> <laughs> the data and the research on this when, um, um, and, and I'm going to cite Brian's book again because it's something that he collects all this information in his book very well, right? Mm-hmm. The it's case like against the, education. The, 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 this notion of transfer learning. Oh, you see this thing here, you can make an analogy to another situation. Turns out that humans are not great at that. We don't, there's not, the evidence of that is not really uh, all there, right? So the notion that you can learn calculus and that sort of framework is going to transfer naturally for you to th- understand the physical world around you in a better way, it's, it's a stretch. It's a big stretch. Does that, you know, can I now make an argument that, well, it's just like exercising, you know, I don't know what's happening when somebody tells me to do a plank. I mean, it's a horrible exercise, and, and, but everybody seems to tell me that <laughs> it's an amazing thing to do. You know, planks are great for your core. And you're like, I don't see it, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, but sure, and it turns out that I think it does work. People actually, if you strengthen your core, lots of things get easier in terms of exercise, right? Can we make that argument that, oh, calculus is kind of like the blank of the brain, you know, helps the brain connect, make connections that then allows you to be better, more logical, so on and so forth in other ways. I don't buy that. I don't buy that. I think that thinking quantitatively, yes, exercising that kind of logic part of your brain, logical part of your brain through various different ways, absolutely. If you're not doing that, you're going to be in trouble at some point. You're not going to be able to be a good thinker in a lot of ways. But I think there's various ways for us to do that exercising of the brain. And if I have a limited amount of time, I would say that learning well to be somebody versed with what data can and cannot tell you, learning well about notions of probability, notions of, because it's, and, and that, that's something that you walk out of the classroom and you're gonna in, immediately, in the, the very same day, you're gonna be exposed to something that is associated with it. That is gonna, you know, the recall is gonna be almost immediate. So I would say that's a great positive move. And I, I, again, I'm biased, of course, because you know I'm a statistician. I think that's something that that has a huge potential impact of improving uh, uh, education at all levels. And I do agree with you. I would prefer that to start earlier on. I think that, that kids, they get exposure to that in high school even, or even middle school, you can just start doing certain things. Uh, they're going to be better served. This might be a very heretical take, but I feel like statistics would have been way more valuable to me in high school than algebra. Mm. Like, I don't work in in anything scientific. I don't need to understand algebra. I don't really use it except as, like, sometimes a mechanism for thinking. Like, I kind of use it metaphorically, but I don't use it practically. Whereas I feel like statistics is an area that I encounter, I mean, honestly, probably on a daily basis. I go on Twitter. I spend a lot of time on Twitter. I go on Twitter and somebody's sharing some stats about something, often education related, because that's a bunch of the people I follow, but sometimes totally unrelated. I'm like, I kind of have to take your word for it sometimes if I don't have, like, you know, you you have to understand how to think in terms of statistics in order to uh, be able to assess the information being handed to you. So I can teach you stats without calculus. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard to teach you stats at any meaningful way without some notions of algebra. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the stacking sort of like, uh, uh, you know, algebra is needed. I think that's to to some degree, right? Of course. Yes, yes. I mean, there's maybe not all the curriculum in high school. I don't know. I mean, more as an end point. Right. Like I say, no, an as an end, end point, end no, end no, 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 no. And as an ending, for sure, no, no, absolutely. Without, I think algebra is a means to an end. Algebra by yeah. itself is nothing. Uh, it's really something that you then layer on, you know, becomes a necessary step to do lots of things, including, including, you know, more useful stats. You're going to need to know a little bit of algebra, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, stopping just at algebra, which I think is what the curriculum is required to start. Stop. Yeah, is that correct? Two, it, it, at least in Pennsylvania, where I grew up, it was two years of algebra and a year of geometry. And that okay, was, geometry, that was again, I, a lot of geometry, I actually think is super useful mm-hmm. uh, and and necessary for lots of things that you encounter, you know, physically and do in your life, even if you're not thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, geometry does help. And if I, I was cooking pizza yesterday for the first time, Geometry helps, you know. <laughs> so there's, there's some basic <laughs> notions on geometry there uh, that, that that are important. So so I do think, um, but but yeah, I I, I hope that stats become something more pervasive in, in high schools. 
uh, going up. Now, you know, the 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 we mentioned my my freshman class, and uh, so I teach this class that the Salem Center developed. Uh, and the class is like the name is a little weird, but the name of the class is something like um, um, trade offs and evidence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, the the, the notion that we want to think about a choice in the world could be a policy, but any choice. The choice involves a trade-off and the, the sort of science of understanding that and think through that is economics. Economics is a is a the science of you know uh, making decisions in scarce setups, right? So understanding that you face a trade-off and making a choice. Um, but then the evidence is like, okay, how even if I theoretically understand the trade-offs that I face, I need to evaluate their magnitudes, and that's going to require the evidence. And 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 you know, so 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 in that class, we try to teach them. Um, a little bit about basic, because these are freshmen from all over campus. They're not majors in any field that is you know, specific to this. So they could, I could have a dance student, they could have an engineer in the classroom, right? So I'm trying to teach a class that that, that goes cuts across different kinds of, of interests and abilities. Um, so we teach a little bit of intro econ, some basic tools of economics. They are really useful to help you think through trade-offs. And then we teach some very basic tools of statistics that helps you think through, you know, uh, a understanding what data can and cannot tell you. And then we'll go through a lot of case studies in the class and things like from, you know, what happens if you expand um, Medicare, for example, right? Does that make people healthier or not? What are the evidence that we have for that? What are the trade-offs that we face? So on. So, so you know, we, and, and we do in that class try to touch on things that are very salient in their minds and can be controversial because it's in the world that we live right now. So you mentioned earlier on, um, uh, police shootings, for example. Well, we actually spend time reading some papers and evidence about police shootings, how the economics helps think about that and how the evidence teaches about that, right? Um, and what I find in that class is that it's actually pretty positive, the result in the end, how students become sort of able to, in the end, looking at a case study to be like, all right, so we need to ask some questions. Here are the things we need to consider. You know, some, there's some basic sort of checkpoints that you have to go through to start making sense of that evidence and see whether that, you know, uh, uh, you, you're going to weigh it positive or not or whether it's useful or not and, and then helps you now inform your decision. I try to stress with them the fact that because uncertainty is going to be everywhere, very rarely you're going to have the answer in an analysis like that. And that's one of the ways in which I think we will get in so many fights on Twitter and so on is that mm -hmm. there's no right answer necessarily in a lot of situations, you know, there's, there'll be uh, pros and cons and there'll be this all, but we should be able to agree on the evidence, on the magnitude. And we still might disagree on what the decision should be because we have a system of values that might differ, right? You have a system of values, I have a different one. We look at the exact same evidence. We evaluate it the same way. You still make decision A, I make decision B. That's fine, but we should not disagree on the evidence. We should have the way to at least, you know, get, get to that point, right? Uh, now, obviously, people can be very tendentious in the way that they try to present evidence, and therefore, uh, you know, can you really trust that evidence? You know, that way. But, and, and that's so. So, yeah, if somebody's on Twitter presenting a case, and like, you know, you have to take into account what perspective they're coming from, and therefore discount things a little bit. And the unfortunate part is that on academia is a place where you would hope that those biases don't exist. If evidence is presented in a very sort of like, you know. Uh, uh, unbiased way. And it just, just happens that, you know, academia has become a place that's very biased as well, which then you have to be thinking about that uh, a little bit. Now, some fields better than others, but, but, uh, but the, but even like, it, te we can teach that to people. We can teach to people the notion that, you know, things might come with a certain bias associated with it. Might be very, very hard to get away from that bias, but at least you can think it through and help sort of create a mechanism to discount where appropriately uh, the evidence is put in front of you. You mentioned earlier that you have stories about like- The freshmen. Yes. I feel like you have such a good, anyone who works with freshman college students has a really good pulse on the state of education in general mm -hmm. in America. Um, can we hear some of these stories? <laughs> yes. I hope I'm not breaking any laws by sharing some of this. Um, <laughs> So we run a survey. I run a survey every year mm -hmm. in the beginning of the class. And again, the class is a class on, on policy issues. So what I try to do, what I try to teach them is this. A policy is an attempt to change the world in a particular way. So in order for you to think about making a change in the world, uh, an important 
thing is to know where you are, right? If you don't know where you are, you don't know how you're gonna get somewhere, right? So if you're gonna try to go somewhere, you need to know where you are first. So do you know where you are is the number one question. And then you can think about evaluating the potential choices you have in front of you. So the first day in class, we do a do you know where you are type, type of survey, where what I do is to list to them a lot of like facts about the world, questions on facts, not disputable facts, things you are just like easily catalog, you know, um, very important facts. And, I'll, and then I ask questions that are related to things that we're gonna miss potentially see later on, right? And what you get out of the survey is like mind boggling because it's year after year I've done this. And, and by the way, this is not something that I invented. People have done this. Uh, there is this, um, if you're not familiar with the work of this guy called Hans Rosalind, uh, there's a book called Factfulness. It's a great example of, of the same type of thing. Um, uh, he ended up working for Google and trying to help people visualize data and understand the world mm -hmm. and so on. So here's, a, I think, the most scary question that I ask every year that they get it wrong. I ask the question, the last 20 years, what has happened to poverty in the world? Multiple choice. It has doubled, it has divided in half, it has remained the same. And I define what poverty is, like some measure of poverty by the UN of like, you know, um, the answer is that it has divided by two. Poverty has been mm -hmm. I mean, po poverty has been falling down steadily for the longest time, right? Every single one, of, I mean, not every single one, but like a vast, we're talking about 80% of the students or so answer that poverty has doubled. What? Yes. So this is like, and, and, I, and I, so, so that, that to me is one of them that's like, okay. Because if you don't realize that, that the world is actually getting severely better mm -hmm. for vast majority of humans on earth. That's going to have a huge impact on how you go through life, how you think about what needs to be done, how because I mean it's the is the opposite of what's happening is what they think. Okay? So here's another question that the past few years after 2020, summer 2020 asks uh, um, how many on average unarmed black men are shot by police in the country per year? What's the answer? I don't know the answer off the top of okay, my head. Okay, I'm gonna give I you some choice. I'm gonna give you multiple choice. I've listened to Roland Fryer, so I know, I know direction. Right, right. So I'm gonna give you a multiple choice. The yeah. multiple choice is 10, mm -hmm. 100, 1,000, or 10,000? 10, 10. 10. The answer's 10. Very large number of students say it's 10,000. 10,000. So they're off by three orders of magnitude, okay? Now, I think the vast majority of students, sorry, I'll say a large number of students say 10,000. A lot of, a majority might say 1,000 or something, mm -hmm. right? Still, they're off by a lot, by a lot. Yeah. So. But it's an understandable that conclusion one, to come to. Right. Too. The, right now, that one is easy to think about because, but, but, but I think points to the same problem. Why do they think that poverty has doubled? And why do they think that there's like hundreds of thousands of, you know, or not hundreds of thousands, but tens of thousands of men, black men being shot by police? Well, because the exposure that they get through whatever sources they are looking at really likes to focus on negative events. And, and you know, you don't see, it doesn't sell to put on TV like, man, today, businesses in the world did a little bit better. You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff is not really uh, all that interesting as a, as a news story <laughs> versus like, oh, a kid here die or whatever. Yeah, those things do happen. It's unfortunate. So one, but the, the, the story of the world in the past many, many, many years, I mean, since if you want to be, since the Industrial Revolution is a positive story. It's a story of progress. It's a story of, it's an amazing story. Mm -hmm. And and we don't teach that. We don't seem to be, you know, exposing our students to that amazing story. We try to think about, oh, there's this little negative blips. Yes, there's negative blips. But like you're looking at the minutia as opposed to looking at this giant thing in front of you that is showing us a world that gets better, better, and better. Now I asked them, uh, what uh, scientists predict is going to happen to the temperature of the earth in the next 100 years. And every single one says, getting warmer. So clearly they're able to acquire information out there, <laughs> but there's the different levels, different the, there's preferred information that they receive, right? And, and right. so on. Um, and I remind them, in the, once we look at the results, it's kind of funny, right? They kind of laugh and so on, because like, it's a little embarrassing <laughs> um, that they get um, so many things so wrong. And... And um, uh, I remind them, like, listen, you are probably, I mean, so the U U University of Texas, if folks listening don't know this, we have a very selective procedure to get people into the University of Texas at Austin. 
if you finish in the top 6% of your high school graduating class in Texas, you're kind of a guaranteed an admissions uh, in the ET, uh, ET Austin. So we know the top 6% of high, graduating high school students in the state of Texas. If you think about in terms of education, where do they place, the, where are those people in the distribution of education in the world, do you think? If you're in the top 6% of the state of Texas. In the world at large, you're, yeah. pretty, you're pretty high up there. I mean, you're gonna be in the top probably 0.01% of the world in terms of you know education achievement at that point in life, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the elite, the elites. And if the elites of the elites don't know that, I get nightmares associated. That's like, okay, so that, I don't know. That's, that's a problem, right? That is a problem, man. And um, that shows that we're, that we're doing something wrong in K through 12. We're doing something wrong. Especially when it comes to like social studies and, and, and uh, um, but even like scientific t studies, because if you, if you observe the, or understand what has happened in terms of scientific progress that we've made, you would not think, I don't think you would necessarily think that, but, but, but that's, no, that's where we are. It would be very obvious to the opposite. Exactly. So what you've seen both inside of academia and also inside the classroom working with these freshman students, plus the reading that you've done, um, how has all of this affected how you think about the K-12 education of your own kids? Right. Um, so two things had a huge impact on my on my um, thinking as a parent. So I have a 12-year-old that's now in middle school, and I have a six-year-old that's about to start school. So, uh, you know, I spent my entire career in academia. I went through traditional schools, very like, you know, hard and structured schools. And I, I was always very good in school. That's how you become a professor. You said <laughs> somebody that was always good in school. So I was like an A student my entire life. Um, and, and, and then, you know, you have a kid and the natural thing to do is to think about the, your kid as you think about yourself. So the first school that we went with my 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 uh, my twelve year old was a school that was a little bit traditional, was right close to the University of Texas here on ca the campus. Very traditional, very grammar, traditional grammar, traditional math. They use a Saxon math mm -hmm. uh, system, which is actually I think is a pretty decent uh, um, thing. Very small school. I like the idea of a small school. Again, by looking at a little bit of the research on that, the benefits are not gigantic, but they are there. And if you can afford it, okay, fine, let's do that. Right. Um, and then I, 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 so I was in a traditional path. My kid was doing very well. He's, you know, very, he's very similar to me in that sense of, of liking school and doing well in school. The second one is not, by the way. So it's kind of funny how <laughs> things can be very different <laughs> from kid to kid. Um, but then I realized something, to, for, before I realized two things happened. Uh, I read The Coddly in the American Mind, a book that came out, I think in 2017 or 18, right? Mm -hmm. By uh, and I read around the same year, I think I read The Case Against Education by Kaplan. And those two books, there were a lot of elements of those books, things that I already know, things that I kind of knew what was happening and so on. Mm -hmm. But both of those books are extremely good at making and putting together the evidence from various sources on the two topics they're talking about in a way that's very convincing. And it's not convinced because they're just argument well. No, it's there. It's 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 structured with evidence in a way that's like okay, if you read the evidence clearly, you get like whoa, right? So starting with the coddling, to me the message. There's a lot of messages there. There's a lot of things about mental health that comes up, and you know there's a new doc documentary coming out about the book and so on. And there's a follow up book that they wrote. But the the one thing that stuck with me uh, that was very um, influential was this notion that the the current generation was a generation that was always looking for affirmation from the top, from some sort of uh, authority figure telling them, you know, is this right or wrong? So like the, what do I do to get an A kind of, kind of attitude, as opposed to like, oh no, I'm learning this thing and the A is a consequence, mm -hmm. as opposed to, no, what do I need to do to get an A? And you see that. So when, and, and you know, that they, they try to trace the psychological reasons for that from various sources, the excess protecting of our kids. And, and that's something that, you know, playgrounds now have squishy, you know, things on the floor mm -hmm. as opposed to like <laughs> places where you had to learn don't fall because, you know. Um, so that whole book made me think about two things. First of all, step a little bit back and let my, you know, take a little bit of the, the, the guardrails off the way I was handling my kids in, in lots of different ways, right? So let them get hurt more, let them, let them exp 
and that sounds bad, I suppose, but <laughs> that, what I mean by letting them get hurt more, like let them figure stuff out more mm -hmm. as opposed to just trying to be too protective, too helicopter, get away from the helicopter things. That was number one. But the one in terms of education that was very important was this notion that they need to, to have agency on their learning as opposed to uh, the motivation being coming from the outside, external validation for their learning, right? So I was like, okay, and I'm, I'm looking at my kid becoming somebody that was very motivated by what do I what do I need to do to get an A? And, and I was like, no, 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 this has to change, right? At the same time, reading Brian's book, you learn about all these things that, you know, shows us that the system that we have is not optimal in any way. The system that we have has no indication that it does work in the long run in a way that, you know, the people that do well, they do well for other reasons, not necessarily the, 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 what, the way the system was provided in front of them. And also things that, you know, learning science have dealt, is there in the book as well, things about self-directed learning, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So at that point, uh, I, I was, we live in Austin and Austin's a place that there's a lot of alternatives. There's a lot of different people talking about education uh, reform and transformation. So, and I happen to run in those circles a lot. I had some friends that had gone through this thing called the Acton Academy. I had a chance to meet uh, Jeff Senefer that, that started uh, the school. And, and, and you know, you, you look at what they did and I, I was very impressed by the, the thinking about what are the goals? How are we gonna reverse engineer to get something that delivered on, on those goals, right? And observing in particular a friend that had their, their middle school or now moving to high school there, I was like, you know, this is something that I want to learn more about, and we visit and so on, and and we took the took the, the the plunge of going into a system that is, I mean, the opposite of what my son was doing before, and the things that I was hoping to accomplish with that, it's been delivered like, and it's amazing. It's just amazing how he took ownership of it. He's like somebody. I mean, it's just like he's learning for the reasons that he should be learning. He's doing the things because he wants to do them. He's like. It, you know, just taking, taking charge of his growing process. And, and I'm there just to, you know, provide guardrails, provide motivation sometimes for things. You know, again, the curation part, sometimes they don't know what exists out there that would be potentially interesting to learn about. And I might show them like, listen, there's just there's things over here. They're kind of cool. Here's the things that you can do with that. But now whether they pursue or not, well, that's going to be kind of his, his choice. And, and, and there's a lot of that, that, because uh, once they choose, they have the space there to really deliver and master it, right? Because they, it's not that uh, the routine of being forced upon and, and so on. So that I, and, and seeing that happening at that age also tells me that, well, of course we can do that in, high, in higher education. We don't, you know, it's much more, in some ways it's a lot harder to, to, to manage 12 year olds, seven year olds than, than it is to 18 year olds, right? So if you can see that done so well at that level, so efficiently at that level, I mean, this is a school that's run with three adults. For how many kids? 100, I don't know, 80, something like that. They don't have staff, they don't have anything. And it's like amazing what they accomplished there. The level of work, the quality of work that these kids are doing and, and, and I mean, it's just, it's impressive. It's very, very impressive. As you're thinking about this has evolved, how have you thought about the benchmarks of a good education for your own children. Like when they turn 18 and they're ready to go, I either enter higher education or enter the world in some other capacity, depending on what path they choose. I don't know if that's heretical to say to an academic, like if no, your kids decide it, not to go, go to, to college. college. Yeah, yeah, no. I, I, uh, uh, <laughs> so the the unfortunate part is, 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 that, is that the signaling aspect of it is so mm -hmm. strong still that I do think that for so many different jobs, so many different paths you might want to take, having that stamp in your forehead is kind of necessary. Um, but that said, I think that changes a lot the way I think and they will think probably about the choices that they're going to make going to college, right? Uh, I think they will understand the fact that if you know a lot of it's signaling, right? You are freer in some ways to say like, well, let me pick what I really want to do and do that well. Because as I said before, it's there. If one wants to go to college and do a great job acquiring knowledge, it's there. You might need to do a little legwork, but it's there, right? You you will find a way to do it. It's not the, the way, the bars that we put in front of students are not the bars that are making them do the best kind of work, no. Mm -hmm. But it's there, the availability. So, so I think that the, the, the make, I think that they're gonna be a lot more, my hope is that they're not gonna be stressed about where to go because this notion that kids First, here's an example that I don't understand. So 
if you ask a guy, a counselor in high school, how many schools, let's say a good student in a good district here in Texas, okay, or any town, any place in the country, how many schools should you apply to? What do they say to a student? For colleges? Yeah. Probably five or six. That's is, insane. I, I'm guessing. I no, actually no, don't is, know that. Is, but is, I feel yeah, like that's what I, I was so, told. Something like that. Maybe up I to 10. I applied to none. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe 10, 10, right? Yeah. It, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. There's no notion, oh, what's your dream school? Like, what's your dreams? I mean, there's so many. They're kind of the same. They're all providing you with a similar, again, there's different factories of the stamp, right? Mm -hmm. But and, Texas A&M has the cool swag, so I want to go there. Like, that's the decision-making that, process. A cool, that's a cool decision. Or I like the football team over here. Yeah. Or I like the town. Or I like, you know, trees. Or I like the desert. Mm -hmm. That is, those are, I understand those are part of the decision-making process, right? Mm -hmm. But what I don't understand is why constrain yourself, given that there's so many in a kind of equivalent of what they can provide you in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. So don't get yourself stressed by, oh, my God, I need to get into one of those five. Like, apply to 50. It doesn't cost very much margin. The marginal cost of applying to a lot more is not that high. Um, and then, like, you know, maybe you get into six. And don't stress. Let's see what happens. You get into five of those of the larger set, right? And guess what? You go in and then make an informed decision on which one you want to go to. So reduce the level of anxiety and stress that, like, do you really need to lie to a swimming coach or whatever in order to get to USC, the whole crazy scandal that was happening? Like, is that important for you to go to USC? Why is, why is that? It's just insane to me um, that to be the, for, for that to be the case. And, and, you know, and I'm somebody that went through the sort of prestigious route, right? But you can see that the, the, doesn't, doesn't doesn't matter in some ways. It doesn't matter. You can be a lot more relaxed about it. Now, are there networks that are open some places? They're not open in others? For sure. If you want to be in high finance, chances are you're better off going to a good school in the Northeast. That, 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 that's, it's true. If you can go to Stanford and you care, if you think about you want to be a computer scientist writing the Latin next coolest app in the world, by the way, if it's an app, you might be able to write it from your, you know, high school, whatever, room and, and do just as well. Mm -hmm. But maybe something develops later on in your life. Yeah, if you're able to go to Stanford, sure, that network that's around Stanford is very, very powerful, right? But you don't need to. It's not, the you know, something necessary in any way, shape or form. So I think that take a step back, relax, think hard about what you really want to do mm -hmm. and, and make a choice that's more informed. What about whether or not your kids decide they want to go to college? How do you think about, like, when they reach the end of their K-12 education, mm -hmm. and I'm sure this is, I would imagine this is perhaps a evolving target, but how do you think about, like, this This has been a good education. I feel like they're equipped to either enter university or enter the real world mm -hmm. and do well. What are the things that are most important to you? What are you looking for? What I'm looking for... Um... I don't know. I feel that 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 my middle schooler, I he's already accomplished what I think it's it's uh, like I can carry a conversation with him. He can react to logic in a pretty nice way. You know, I think he reads a tremendous amount, and we 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 are big readers in our household. So the fact that he developed a love for that, what else can I? What else do I want to from him? Right? He loves books, and he loves to acquire information by reading and searching stuff. So. That I think is number one, right? And then, and then he's de clearly a curious person. Uh, uh, so me and my wife, from from the very beginning, uh, you know, we started having kids. We, we talked about, and that's 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 for her. I mean, that's the kind of that's things that she does, not me. And she came up with this, like, okay, I want our kids to be curious and grateful. And number one, oh, my oldest one, absolutely is doing very well in those two dimensions. Uh, little one we're working on. <laughs> uh, but was, I think he is already very gracious and he actually very curious already too. But but, mm -hmm. uh, but, the, but not only Otto, the oldest one is very curious. Uh, it, it's just like he loves the process of, of searching information. And we live in a world where it's so, I mean, you give a kid a, kid a Kindle and they can carry infinite books there. Literally infinite books. It's crazy. Books. It's incredible. Like there in the backpack, he has infinite books in his backpack. I mean, just think about that for a second, right? Like, yeah, it's amazing. And and if you like that, if you if you develop a good relationship with that little to tool, oh my God, the the the, the sky's the limit, right? And so, so that's one. Now, now that's my sort of personal answer, right? But if you think about what it needs, what it needs to be able to do, I mean, the we have research on this as well, right? And the research kind of shows us that you need to be able to manipulate some logical statements algebraically a little bit mm -hmm. that opens a lot of doors in your life. 
need to be able to read, interpret, and write a little bit. Those are the things that really you need to be able to accomplish. Once you accomplish those two things well, um, again, you can do so many different things. And, and I have no doubt that, uh, and that's maybe the part that, you know, doesn't matter when you, when you open your eyes to that. If that's what needs to be accomplished, so many different paths you can get there. As long as those paths are, are, are paths that makes a human a good human, and one that becomes very curious, and so on, that's what you need to encourage, as opposed to get them into a system where you beat the curiosity out of them, which I think is what happens a lot in, in the traditional school environments that we have. I mean, nothing, nothing gets me more upset that a kid says, oh, I don't like to go to school. It's just like, oh my God. I always, I mean, again, I was somebody that always enjoyed, I, I was so, eager to what's next, what's next, what we're gonna learn next, right? There's so much it's amazing things that comes out of that process. Like, oh, I don't like to go to school. It's like, it's so sad. Like, I'm sure that no kid, it's not a matter, oh, that kid is a bad kid for school. No, it's that that kid did not find the environment that will get him excited to go to school. And, and we, we should, have, we should have, have that. Now, the other part of your question was, what if they don't go to college, right? Mm -hmm. If they tell me, if they have a good story for, I mean, first of all, that's not my decision, not to be very clear, but, but it's, uh, <laughs> Uh, if, if I mean, I hope that we have a relationship that if they, they get to the age where college is the option, they say, no, I wanna do this other thing instead. They have a plan and it's a plan that that um, looks like a viable plan. I'll be very supportive. I would hate to see somebody regret that decision, right? So I think it's important to, to understand the costs of making the decision. Because mm -hmm. again, if you wanna be, there's certain things that if you wanna do that there's no alternative, you're gonna have to go through that. Um, but, but some others, you know, I can think that there's a, there's a, <laughs> I, I, again, it's a tangent, but uh, I've, I see a lot of students in the MBA program that I teach at Texas. Um, they are ex-military students and they, they serve in the military. And after I think it's a, it's a very traditional track is like after you get out of the military, you get an MBA, opens a lot of doors and so on. Those are great students in my program always. They're just like, they have the right attitude about learning. And I think that the military actually serves a good purposes in, in, in an education process, like not saying necessarily go to serve the military, but that's, you know, that may be something that if they do after high school for a little bit is, is not a terrible idea. I think it's, it's good for the country. It's good for, for themselves as well. So, so I don't know, I'm a big fan of the military. My dad was in the military. So yeah. I, I'm a big fan of what the, the kind of uh, uh, different kind of education that you acquire in that, in that environment. I have one more very big question for you. Um, we're gonna go back to the statistics thing again. Mm -hmm. If parents are listening to this and they didn't study statistics in high school or college, they have a high level understanding of what it is and how it works, but they've never gone deep, but they're sold on the idea that it's important for their kids mm -hmm. or they want to educate themselves on it. They're like, okay, I need, I need to read some books about this or listen right, to right. some some lectures or something. I need to you know, flesh out my understanding of this. What would be your recommendations? Um, there's a book that I really like that I use sometimes in teaching that's called Naked Statistics. Uh, and that book is written in prose. It's not like technical in any way. And I think it covers, it does a very really good job covering the why this is an important topic and there's school stories, you know, the, the writer is a good writer. There's, there's interesting examples of what it is, you know, what, what you're getting out of it and so on. So I like that as a, as a, as a, place, to, as a place to start. Um, there is, I mean, there's so many things online that one can, one can look for, right? And, and I honestly haven't spent enough time thinking about intro modules for learning statistics for K through 12 at that uh, uh, online. I would guess that that Khan has a decent product on that. Yeah. That would be my guess. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the AP, I'm not so so sure about the AP curriculum necessarily, but, Why? but it, it's, it's too formulaic. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways in which people fail in teaching statistics, and so I, I asked this question always to my students in, in grad school, how many of them took stats? And actually a very large number of of people that went through college take at least one stat class. So everybody raised their hand, right? And I said, okay, how many of you liked it? And like, you know, you get only a few hands up. Right? So, <laughs> so like, okay, I have my work cut out for me, right? You're taking a class that's mandatory for you here in grad school. And, and you know, you saw it before, you didn't like it very much. And the reason for that 
is that it's taught, I mean, a lot, a vast majority of stack classes are taught in a very like formula, focusing on, on, on the wrong things, focusing, oh, the details of formulas and things that, there's this whole game that it develops in the education of, of what it is to do well in a class is to remember some formulas or, you know, to be able to solve a little puzzle that doesn't really exist really in reality, right? It's just like you make things for the purpose of testing people. Um, and there's a lot of that that takes place in basic stack classes. So people just look at it like, oh, I remember there's all these tests and these names and whatever, but they didn't understand the, the essence, why we're doing this, what are the main important lessons here and so on, right? So. What I, when I look at the AP curriculum, what, I'm, what I see is a lot of like, not the, how, where the application really is, where the, the, the sort of big set of ideas that you need to have in your brain in order mm -hmm. to do well in that space versus formulaic things that you might do well in the test and the moment you walk out, psh, disappear from your brain, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's the, and that's why I think Naked Stats is a book that I think does a, is completely reverse of that. There's no formulas in the book, it's about big picture understanding of what, what it is, uh, what's happening here. Amazing. Um, if people enjoyed this conversation, they want to know more about the work that you do, where would you send them next? Well, salemcenter.org is a place that you can, can go. And we also have a YouTube channel. So if you want to, all the good, bad, controversial, not controversial, boring, exciting events that we ever put together uh, are there in our YouTube channel so that people can watch that. Um, get into a newsletter. If you're in town, there's lots of, we always do events and, and it's open to everybody. It's not just the university community. Anybody can come and, and people come, uh, which is which is nice. Um, and and yeah, there also you find, you know, the researchers that work with us, the types of projects that we're involved with. We have a little AI, uh, Milton Friedman bot that we're creating that's going to be released soon with a sub stack that, that you can chat with him and, and so on. So fun things like that also. Um, and yeah, and if you have a question for me, let me know also, my email is there. That's amazing. I can't wait for the Milton Friedman bot. This is so cool. I didn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. This has been great. It's been really great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, my friends, that is a wrap for today. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope that you found this valuable. Please leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. Please like the video on YouTube. And please don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to make sure that you don't miss next week's episode. Thank you so much, friends. I will see you next week.